If you haven't done so yet, please pause the video and try to answer this question on your own before listening on. We're going to make a little mark here at the center of this square so that we can remember where we're trying to calculate the net electric field. Now, because there are four point charges, it's going to be worthwhile to look at the electric field produced by point charges. And we know that that electric field is equal to a constant multiplied by the magnitude of the charge divided by a distance squared. Now, in this case, the distance will be from each charge to the center of the square. And so all those distances will turn out to be the same. And because there are four charges, we're actually going to have to make this calculation four times. And it's useful to organize that into a table that looks like the following. We'll have the four electric fields, and then we're going to end up breaking them into both their x and their y components. Let's start with the electric field E1 that's produced by the charge Q1 at this location right here. Now again, that's going to equal K multiplied by the magnitude of the charge Q1 divided by the distance squared. Now, why don't we go ahead and try to find an expression for this distance right here. If we extend that line all the way, we can see that we would form a nice right triangle right here. Now, the sides of that right triangle are marked A and A, and it turns out that through the Pythagorean theorem, we could deduce that the length of this hypotenuse is actually A times the square root of 2. Now, we only want half that distance because we're going from charge Q1 to the center of the square. So actually, the distance we're interested in is A radical 2 divided by 2. That'll be the distance from each charge to the center. And so we've put in that distance, and we haven't forgotten to square that distance. Now, we only want the x component for this portion of our table. So let's take a closer look at the electric field that's produced by the charge that's marked Q1. We'll note that that charge is positive, so we could put a little positive sign here. And if we imagine dropping a positive charge right here at the center, we would realize that that hypothetical positive charge would be pushed away from charge Q1. Why away? because both this charge and this hypothetical charge have the same sign, and so there would be a repulsive force acting between them. That would cause this hypothetical charge at the middle to be pushed away. Well, it turns out that that's actually the direction of the electric field, E1. And what we have to do is find both the x component, which would point this way, and the y component, which points straight down. Now, in order to do that, we would need this angle right here. And it turns out that because this is a square, that angle is going to be 45 degrees. We can take a quick look at that. If we imagine drawing a line connecting charge Q1 to Q3, we know that because this is a square, that this angle right here would be 45 degrees. And this angle right here, which is alternate interior to that angle, is also going to be 45 degrees. So hopefully that warrants the fact that this is 45. And as mentioned, we're looking for the components. So the x component right here is adjacent to that 45 degree angle, and adjacent means the cosine of the angle. So we're going to have the cosine of 45 degrees. And then this component, which is the y component, is pointing straight down, and it's opposite to that angle. So that's going to be the sine of 45 degrees. So for the y component, we're going to fill in the same expression, except we'll change cosine to sine. Also note that because the y component is pointing down, it's going to be negative in value. So there are the two expressions for the electric field. Perhaps we can simplify it just a little bit. If we square the denominator, we're going to have a squared times 2 over 4. We could then reduce the 2 over 4 to a squared over 2. And then algebraically, that 2 can come up to the numerator. We can do a similar thing to the denominator of the y component. And so now E1 is simplified. Let's go on to E2. And we're going to use the same expression for the electric field, so the constant multiplied by the magnitude of the charge divided by the distance squared. Remember that that distance to the center of the square was A radical 2 over 2. And then in this portion of the table, we're only looking for the x component. So let's go over here to the center of the square again. We're going to once again imagine that we're dropping a positive charge right here. Q2 was told to be a negative charge, and so this hypothetical positive charge would be attracted towards that negative charge, and that turns out to be the direction of the electric field E2. To break it into its components, we're going to have the x component and the y component. Once again, the x component is adjacent to this 45 degree angle, so we're going to have to put a cosine right here. And the y component, which is right here, is opposite to the angle, and so we're going to have to use the sine function. 
And note that that y component is pointing straight upward, and that's the positive y direction. So this time for the y component, we're going to leave it positive. Now we can simplify the denominators in the same manner that we did for e1. Now we'll move along to e3. And so we're going to use the same expression. In fact, the rest of the setups are going to be very similar. What we just need to be careful about is the use of cosine and sine. So let's go over to the center of the square. Let's drop a hypothetical positive charge right there. Noting that Q3 is positive in value, we would see that this test charge would be repelled away from Q3 and it would be pushed off in this direction right here. So this would be E3. We want the X and Y components. So the X component would be pointing to the left. The Y component would be pointing up. Note that the X component, because it's pointing to the left, would be negative. And then the Y component pointing straight up would be positive. So we're going to go ahead and fill in the X and Y components. We'll just be using Q3 instead of Q2 or Q1. And then also, again, the X component's negative and the Y component's positive. Now let's move along over to electric field 4. Again, we'll put this positive test charge in the center. Charge 4 is negative, so that test charge would be pulled towards that negative charge. We have the x component pointing to the left, so it will be negative, and then the y component is pointing down, so it too will be negative. So we'll plug in those expressions for E4. And so now we have all of these electric fields for the x and y components. What we need to do next is sum them. We need to find the total x component and the total y component. And just a little hint for that to make this simpler, if you add up the total electric field in the x direction, then you would be adding these four x components. But they all have a common factor of 2k cosine 45 over a squared. So you could factor out 2k cosine of 45 over a squared. And then what would be left would just be Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3 plus Q4. Note that we're doing the magnitudes. Also note that because we had negative signs on E3 and E4, we actually have those minus signs in the sum of these charges. But interestingly, it, it turns out that when we sum these charges, and remember, again, we're doing the magnitudes, when we sum them together, we get zero for the sum of those charges. So we're going to have 0 multiplied by the 2k cosine 45 over a squared, which of course is 0. So the electric field in the x direction is actually 0 newtons per coulomb. So this effectively all cancels out. We'll go over to the y direction next. And we'll be able to factor out, in this case, a 2k sine of 45 all divided by a squared. And then we would be left with negative the magnitude of charge q1 plus q2 q3, and then minus the magnitude of q4. And then we're ready to plug in the known values. Remember, k is 8.99 times 10 to the 9th. a was given to us in centimeters, so we would have to convert that into meters. So it'll be 0 0.05. And then all of the charges are given in nanocoulombs. So we'll have to make sure we multiply those by 10 to the minus 9 in order to convert them into coulombs. So as long as you make those conversions and plug in, at this point you should get roughly 1.02 times 10 to the fifth newtons per coulomb. So this would be the magnitude of the net electric field produced by the particles at the center of that square. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, please subscribe and also click that thumbs up button. Remember, you can send in your own question to the email address shown on the screen. I'll do my best to post the solution to it on YouTube.